Postdural puncture headaches are a significant problem and the third leading cause of litigation for um, obstetric anesthesia. So it's an important topic. Uh, other things can cause postural puncture headaches besides labor epidurals, but we're going to focus on that here. Um, about half of women will complain of a headache postpartum, but only a small percentage of those are actually postural puncture headaches. So it's important when you're called to go evaluate these patients that you consider all the possibilities. The hallmark symptoms of a postural puncture headache would be a uh, positional, postural nature to it, and that is that when they're upright they have a headache and when they're supine they do not. Um, they may or may not have other symptoms, nausea, vomiting, um, photophobia, changes of hearing. They will usually describe it as fronto-occipital, so it basically covers the whole head, um, and we'll talk more about why that would be. If they didn't have an epidural for labor, it's probably not a postural puncture headache. So that's an important piece to find out. And then you need to consider some of the other possibilities. The differential diagnosis of a postural puncture headache is actually pretty big and includes all of these things. Nonspecific headache, just because of the tension of having just delivered a baby, they probably didn't get much sleep. Migraines, though those are um, not caused by labor, obviously people who are susceptible to them can certainly have one in the peripartum period. Uh, hypertensive encephalopathy, this would be a potentially a preeclamptic headache. So if the patient, for instance, has gone home and comes back with a headache, um, it's very important to check their blood pressure. And if they are hypertensive, to consider a workup for preeclampsia, at least dip their urine for protein before you proceed with a blood patch. Um, drugs, especially withdrawal, caffeine. People get caffeine withdrawal headaches, and uh, that's something to consider. The red ones here are particularly worrisome. If a patient has meningitis, obviously this needs to be treated immediately, and a blood patch would not be the treatment of choice. So we need to check to make sure they don't have a fever. Intracranial hemorrhage and uh, cortical vein thrombosis or sagittal vein thrombosis are both also big deals. Now those should have neurologic findings. Um, and then you can see here some of the other possibilities. Press is a relatively uh, uncommon and sort of new thing that we're talking about, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. But so if they have this classic positional headache and they did have a, a, a documented wet tap, makes it easy. If it was no documented wet tap but um, a difficult epidural placement, then again, your likelihood goes up. Um, if there's no documented wet tap, it went in easily, it can still be um, a postural puncture headache because you can make a tiny little rent in the dura. So the risk factors for a postural puncture headache Sorry about my handwriting. Risk factors. Those include being 20 to 40 years old so little kids don't tend to get postural puncture headaches. Um, the elderly patients getting total hips don't tend to get postural puncture headaches, but uh, 20 to 40 year olds do. Women are more likely. So obviously this is a setup for pregnant women. Um, a lower BMI. Um, obesity seems to be somewhat protective of getting a, a postural puncture headache. And then history of headaches, migraines, previous postural puncture headache, those would all increase the risk. Those are all the non-modifiable risk factors. The things we can modify would be the needle that we choose. And there's two things here. One is the shape of the needle. So we have at our disposal some that are called pencil point needles, shaped something like this. Those could be Whitaker or Sprott needles and those are considered non-traumatic, atraumatic needles, um, and they do look just like the end of a pencil. And then we have cutting needles, like the standard quinky, um, the Tui needle is also a cutting needle. And the difference between using a cutting needle or a non, uh, a pencil point needle is pretty significant. So if you look up here at the incidence of postural puncture headache, um, at 
2E needle is down in the 16 to 18 gauge range and if you make a hole you're pretty much getting a headache. When we get down to our standard spinal needle size of about 25 gauge, um, the risk with a pencil point is very, very low. If it's a cutting needle, it's significantly higher, although still pretty low. And when you get down to 27 gauge, there's not a huge difference between the two. Um, anything lower than a 27 gauge becomes difficult to use. It's just too flimsy. And also, it becomes more difficult to tell that whether you're getting CSF back, and so you tend to uh, make multiple holes, which sort of defeats the purpose. So the needle, both the shape and also the size, are important. Smaller is better. Um, the bevel orientation is actually important, um, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And then obviously the number of holes. So if it takes multiple passes and you miss the fact that you were already in, so you make multiple holes, they're going to leak more CSF and have a, of a bigger headache, which sort of brings up the pathophysiology. So, so what is it that causes these women to get a headache? And there are a couple of different theories that seem to make some, uh, some sense. One is the brain sag theory and that's not the actual name of it. Um, but so if you imagine somebody's cranial cavity, something like that, and you put a brain in it, ordinarily there's a bunch of CSF in between keeping the brain floating. But if you have a big leak of that CSF and you end up with the brain sagging, then whenever you stand up, the brain's going to fall down, you're going to get pain here. There's also bridging vessels here, and when those get stretched by the brain sagging, then you get pain there too. So the brain sag is one reason, and it sort of explains the positional nature of it. The other thought is the Monroe Kelly hypothesis, which hopefully you remember, and that is that there are three components to the intracranial vault. One is CSF, one is blood, and one is tissue. And of course, the other would be pathologic, like blood from a hemorrhage or a tumor. So if the amount of blood goes down, or, I'm sorry, if the amount of CSF goes down, then something else has to take its place and what appears to happen is that the blood vessels dilate in response and so you get this um, dilation of both veins and arteries and the pulsing of those is what contributes to the headache and so that would explain why some patients get better with caffeine or triptans, which are generally considered treatments for migraine headaches. So that's from uh, vascular reactivity. So it's probably some combination of the two of these and, and perhaps even a few other things. So what happens when somebody gets this, this headache? The uh, natural history of a posterior puncture headache is an onset, sometimes, rarely it's immediate, but usually it's within about 36 hours, but can be as late as days. Um, if untreated, most go away within one to two weeks. Unfortunately, with patients with new babies, waiting one to two weeks is not practical, and so they very often need therapy. Um, there are some complications if it goes untreated, including cranial nerve palsies from the brain resting on nerves, um, cranial nerve 6 is the one that is the most famous for getting um, trapped because it has the longest course underneath the brain. That's abducens. It'll cause a horizontal diplopia. And um, actually you can get a subdural hematoma from these bridging vessels getting broken and, and actually bleeding into the cranium. How can we keep from doing this? Well, obviously don't make a hole in the dura with an epidural needle. It's not the goal, and, and doing that is a problem. And so an inexperienced provider is another one of the risk factors. 
Um, it may be that positioning the patient laterally instead of sitting could reduce the risk because there's just less CSF in the back at the time, and so the dura is maybe not as, as um, pooched out toward the needle. Um, the needle bevel we mentioned before. So if you have your back here, and you orient your needle, a cutting needle, horizontally, which is probably the more common way to do it, um, you're going to make a hole that looks like this. If you orient your needle vertically, then the hole is going to look more like this. And the couple of studies have shown that this hole has a decreased incidence of headache and maybe as much as 20% for this one and 80% for a perpendicular placement. And so the original thought was that this must be because the dural fibers run vertically and so you end up just spreading them if you put the needle in this direction. In fact, that's not true. The dural fibers go everywhere. And so we think instead that it has to do with the way that the hole changes configuration when you move. So a patient moving around, this hole is going to tend to close, and this one is going to tend to, to be pulled open. So needle bevel direction, if you're using a cutting needle, um, should be aligned parallel to the spine. Uh, turns out that it may be a little more challenging to thread the catheter out that hole when you do it that way. There may be some more paresthesias. There's not an increase in intravascular cannulation and the epidural works just as well. Rotating the needle uh, does increase your risk of dural puncture because if you imagine that the needle tip is right up against the dura to create the epidural space that you need and you then rotate it, you might cut like a little smile into the dura and then increase your risk of postural puncture headache.